young perspective on hot button issues around the world. This is The Hub. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Wang Guan in Beijing. The 37th Assembly of the African Union Summit has just ended in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. This gathering brought together leaders from across the continent, providing a crucial platform for dialogue, collaboration, and exploration of new paths. The agenda covered the spectrum as diverse as the African continent itself, addressing peace, development, and of course the ever pressing matter of security. How might the outcomes of this summit reshape the organization's policies and what lies ahead for the nations of Africa? To shed light on the just concluded summit, we're honored to be joined by Erastus Mwancha, former Deputy Chairperson of the African Union Commission. Mr. Mwancha, welcome back to the Hub. Thank you very much. Yeah. Chairman Mwancha, what were the key priorities that took center stage at this year's African Union Summit, and why do you think they're important to Africa now and to the future of Africa? The seventh summit that has just ended here in Addis Ababa, of course, discusses many items being an annual meeting of heads of state and government. Uh, but this summit here focused on some key areas, uh, of course, which was under the theme of education. But as you would expect, it also featured uh, on peace and security. It looked at uh, the progress that is ma being made in the area of trade. It looked at the aspect of climate change and the impact it's having, uh, the issues of uh, global financial architecture, and uh, it was, uh, I would say, overall very successful summit. Also, there is the new um, chairperson of the African Union, Mohamed al Ghazouani. The president of Mauritania has been elected as the new chairperson of AU uh, going forward. Um, do you expect largely a consistency and continuity of policy of the AU? What potential transformations uh, do you anticipate in the dynamics of the AU and its engagement with external partners? Uh, I, with no one expects a major change. Africa's dialogue with uh, development partners, global external partners, is already cast in a very clear uh, you know, terms. And so this will be a continuation. And it's not the first time that Mauritania is assuming chairmanship of the union. Just about less than 10 years ago, Mauritania was uh, leading and uh, that consistency was uh, underlined during that time. During the summit, AU leaders condemned uh, Israel's offensive in Gaza and calls for its immediate end. Uh, how does the conflict outside the continent uh, resonate with Africa, particularly concerning the situation in Gaza? Um, we have known that uh, a number of uh, Security Council resolutions um, on a ceasefire could not be um, reached because some country uh, rejected this ceasefire resolution. How do you look at all this? The African Union has always had the solidarity with the Palestinians. And uh, in fact, the Palestinian leader was here and they spoke at the summit. Beyond that, as you rightly mentioned, yes, there was condemnation. Uh, for the humanitarian crisis that is there. And the leaders here, of course, like uh, the rest of the world, has uh, condemned the, 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 what you might call uh, injustice committed at mass level. Innocent Palestinians being killed. The leaders, of course, expressed uh, anxiety that invasion of Afar should be really discouraged and stopped uh, so that there is humanitarian assistance and they go back to finding a political solution, which Africa has always said that a two-state solution is the only way forward. How do you envision the future trajectory of this pan-Africanism? Do you believe that uh, the prospect of a new Africa beyond borders and boundaries and you know, differences is becoming uh, a reality at some point? Pan-Africanism is what informed independence for African states, and the pan-Africanism continues to uh, be a spirit that uh, really enjoins Africans to work together for the common emancipation of the Africans wherever they are. Uh, so Africa is uh, saying we must not forget the journey of a united Africa. And uh, this is, of course, being discussed under uh, Africa trying to create uh, a large market uh, so that Africa can be able to transform its economies. That is the underlying factor of Pan-Africans. Yeah, Chairman Mwancha, uh, last Saturday, Chinese President Xi Jinping sent a congratulatory message to the 37th African Union Summit. 
President Xi Jinping stressed that over the past year, China-Africa relations have grown substantially. Uh, how would you assess the current state of China-Africa relations overall, and uh, what key areas do you see for further collaboration to deepen these ties? Very well received, and don't forget that uh, late in the year, there is going to be the FOCAC summit, and uh, preparation is already underway for that meeting to take place. And that meeting has always uh, uh, engendered very good spirit within the cooperation of Africa-China cooperation. And uh, China-Africa is already very settled and uh, very well in craft. And uh, it has always been a source of uh, uh, identifying priorities, modalities of cooperation. And so many leaders will always look forward uh, to meeting again, particularly with the presence of President Xi Jinping, to chart out the way forward, especially looking at the key issues now facing the world. Uh, economic uh, distress, uh, global ch climate change, uh, and of course, uh, what we are seeing as protectionism that is hurting the world. Across the continent, however, in the recent uh, years, we've seen resurgence of military coups, pre- and post-election violence, uh, humanitarian crises linked to war, and the effects of climate change, as you mentioned. How do you perceive the role of African Union, uh, and this summit in particular, in addressing critical issues in Africa and fostering unity, which many consider is long overdue? As you would expect, the matters of peace and security still occupy the center stage at the summit, uh, besides education, which was the theme. And of course, of concern, as you have rightly mentioned, is the unconstitutional change, which is informed by, you know, uh, uh, democracy receding in a number of countries and a number of countries that uh, have had unsuccessful elections or call it elections that were disputed. But largely, this is really, again, a matter that has uh, exercised the minds of the leaders to say, let's go back to the drawing board and ask ourselves where things are not working well, uh, which I think to me points in the right direction. Because uh, other than condemning and constitutional, but there is also a question that is being asked, why now and why at this scale? when there was a lull for many years from 2001 to almost 2019 when we started to see this. In 2024, more than 20 new countries are expected to join the you know, existing seven in the Guided Trade Initiative. How do you see this trade, trade area of Africa coming along? That is one of the highlights of this summit. It was discussed and, of course, uh, noting progress that has been made, particularly in preparing the various protocols. Uh, one of the protocols that was unfailed here is a digital trade, which was very well received. And uh, as you rightly mentioned, the guided trade was done under five countries, for five countries in 2023. It was largely successful. There were lessons learned from it and expanding it. But of course, the intention is not to continue on this guided trade. It's when this process of trade making is finished, uh, this is really like proof of concept that is being undertaken. The, the idea is then to embark on uh, all Africa trade uh, under the preferential arrangements that have been agreed upon with the protocols that have already been uh, uh, accessed to, acceded to by member states, and, and of course moving to uh, customs union and the rest down the road. What do you identify as the major barriers? for this African continent free trade area uh, from becoming a, a reality? I mean, there are different customs, different uh, access uh, standards, and uh, different uh, stages of development concerning different African countries. And many would consider that um, it could be a tall order for this um, African free trade area to be a reality in the foreseeable future. But how do you look at this? You mentioned uh, right there a number of them, like standards and the rest. But to me, the key one, is uh, infrastructure. If you look at Africa, the continent, the mass uh, uh, land that is there, uh, the development of infrastructure that can allow movement of goods uh, from one part of Africa to the other is hampered by many obstacles. And uh, during the guided trade, this came out very well. For instance, if you look at products which were sent, say, from South Africa to Tunisia, you have to use sea which is not so much of a difficult. But if you think of sending goods from 
Kenya, say, to Ghana, you have to go around uh, Europe or, you know, South Africa because there is no link. And so infrastructure is key. Uh, apart from infrastructure, uh, you really need uh, transformed, uh, you know, products because Africa at the moment is largely trading in uh, rock and dust uh, because that's what Africa exports to uh, the rest of the world. This cannot be exported to Africa. If you add value to this, because these same products which come from exported rock and dust out of Africa come to Africa as finished goods and at exorbitant prices. This is where Africa is also aiming to go. In other words, to produce value-added products. And of course, China has been a, a strong partner in you know, working with Africa in delivering some of these infrastructure projects. Some are you know, mutually beneficial for some um, are with, not without their, you know, questions and doubts. Uh, but overall, uh, how do you expect this China-Africa partnership to continue to deliver infrastructure-wise, uh, be it hard infrastructure like roads, bridges, and ports and airports, uh, and also the unconventional infrastructure, be it uh, mobile payment systems, um, so on and so forth? This is key. And as you rightly mentioned, if you look at where China's... Uh, uh, worked with Africa to develop this infrastructure. Uh, if you look at the rail, uh, whether it is the Mombasa, Kigali rail, uh, if you look at the Southern Africa uh, corridor, you look at the Northern Africa aspect, uh, the Djibouti, this is helping to reduce cost and time of doing business. And this is precisely the key aspect. Uh, but as you mentioned, infrastructure is a key in that area. In addition to that, of course, Africa needs now to look at how do you facilitate trade because uh, uh, the currencies become an hindrance, especially, you know, if you have to organize payments from one country to the other, the payments go via outside Africa. And it costs money, it costs time. That aspect is being worked on and there's a project that is being supported by Flexing Bank and the rest. Uh, and in addition to that, of course, uh, trying to make sure that you have tradables, goods that can be traded upon. What is your forecast uh, when it comes to Africa? Uh, of course, Africa is not this monolithic hoe, but uh, let's say the, the, the more uh, developed part of Africa, uh, first of all, moving up the value chain, you know, stopping being this exporter of raw materials only, but really having these raw materials processed and industrialized in Africa and selling to the outside world higher value-added goods. Yes, you are starting to see a number of uh, projects that are being implemented in Africa. For instance, uh, you can now access uh, fertilizer that is produced in Africa, which is a key uh, intermediate product for uh, the development of agriculture. A number of uh, uh, machineries are now being assembled in Africa. Africa is really very keen to start uh, adding value to some of uh, the key raw materials, particularly for greening the economy under climate change. As you know, Africa is home to a number of what you might call green minerals and all that. So the conversation is now for partnerships and uh, looking out for uh, the friendly countries that uh, would join Africa in uh, add value to these minerals which go out as rock and dust. Yeah, finally, uh, Mr. Chairman, let me ask you about education because 2024 is actually designated by the African Union as a year of education. But we know that there are um, multiple challenges. And you yourself admitted that, quote unquote, despite our collective efforts and progress, a shocking nine out of 10 kids in Africa struggle to read and comprehend a simple text by the age of 10. This isn't just a statistic. It symbolizes millions of deferred dreams, countless untapped potentials, and a compromised future. Um, can you tell us a bit about Africa's learning crisis and how do you see them being addressed? This is, of course, a, a subject that took uh, center stage and is going to be a theme for the rest of the year. And in the run-up to the summit, a number of sessions were held to look at what affects education in Africa. Uh, right from, uh, if you look at the number of children in Africa uh, that are a school-going age, from, say, age 5 to 19, is about that 5% of Africa's population. And each of that child that should be going to school uh, in global standards, uh, in terms of per capita cost of educating that child, Africa is not spending enough 
And that is because Africa has challenges in terms of debt repayment and in uh, competing challenges. In, and But also, uh, Africa is not able to put all these children who should be going to school to be in school. In other words, if you look at, for instance, the number of kids that complete primary education uh, is just about 60%. Now, where do the 40% go? That is key because you don't have enough capacities in secondary and post-secondary for them to be able to uh, advance and become proficient in some of the areas that they aspire to be, to become doctors, engineers, and the rest. If a kid is not able to be literate and enumerate, in other words, be able to read the frontier and be able to understand some of the numerical activities by age 10, it means they are missed out in education for the rest of their life. And as you mentioned, it's a very small percentage that acquire that. And why is that? It has to do with uh, teacher-student ratio, the quality of the environment, uh, kids being given good pedagogy, how you teach it and what you teach. So there is a lot uh, push to try and heighten this because uh, if you look down the, the decades to come, Africa is going to be a major supply of uh, labor, but that has to be quality labor, well-educated and well-grounded. Uh, At the moment, Africa is losing its uh, asset in terms of the human capital because of uh, inadequacy of education. So funding, particularly uh, looking at the budget, at least spending 20% of the national budget on education. But of course, you look at the competing needs of these countries, including debt repayment. At the moment, if you look at debt repayment in some of the countries going up to about 70% of uh, the national budget, how are you going then to be able to spend 20%? These are critical issues and uh, one that is yet really to find what, what one would call a lasting solution. Yeah, hopefully um, your advice will be heeded and those aspirations will become a reality soon for our friends in Africa, of course, across the world. Um, in China, we're uh, trying very hard to, to put the countryside in, on par with the developed areas of China. The urbanization is going on in earnest. Uh, thank you once again, Mr. Aristus Moancha, former Deputy Chairperson of the African Union Commission. Thank you for coming back on The Hub. Thank you so much for having me. Now for more on Africa's trade blueprint, earlier I had a conversation with Albert Muchanga. He's the Commissioner for Trade and Industry of the African Union Commission. We'll come back after a short break. Focus, focus on what's relevant in China and the world. Bridge the, bridge the gap between what you know and what you want to know. This is The Hub. China's global trade footprint is expanding and Africa, the youngest continent, is gaining gradual economic importance among key trading partners. I had the opportunity to interview Albert Mudenda Muchanga, the African Union Commissioner for Economic Development, Trade, Tourism, Industry and Minerals. Join me as he shed lights on the African perspectives on global trade and how the continent actively participates and benefits from Chinese initiatives and practices. Commissioner Muchanga, welcome to Shanghai, China. Thank you very much. And now we're into the second decade of the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, mm. We've just celebrated the first. Um, how do you see the merits of the BRI going forward? Belt and Road Initiative has contributed to opening up Africa through the development of infrastructure. A good example is the, the linkage between um, Djibouti and Ethiopia. Through that, Ethiopia is, it has a very reliable source to external markets. They can move goods from Ethiopia to the rest of the world. They can move goods from the rest of the world to Ethiopia and it can go on to other parts of Africa. Then you've got issues of telecommunications, which are very, very, very important. Then at the level of Africa wide, we are cooperating with China on the development of quality infrastructure. And uh, through that, uh, we are going to develop the Made in Africa standard. Mm, and when it, that label comes up, 
a company producing in Africa that gets the, the to use the made in Africa standard should meet certain criteria which are under develop, um, development now. And we're doing so with the national uh, regulatory agencies, standard agencies, so that uh, there's buy-in right from the beginning. Mm, so these are some of the elements of cooperation which uh, I imagine and they're quite uh, very useful. And they're going to build on, on uh, the focus on industrialization uh, agricultural modernization and talent development. In uh, Johannesburg, South Africa, the Chinese president, President Xi, met with the leaders of Africa, including the leader of the African Union. This China-African dialogue uh, session taking place uh, on the sidelines of the BRICS summit. How do you look at the importance of that meeting? Very important. I attended the meeting. That's why the president of China indicated that uh, we should deepen collaboration in the three key areas of industrialization, agricultural modernization, and the talent development. And shortly after that, we had the, a meeting in uh, Atababa where we are making the, the review of uh, 10 years after Brexit. The Embassy of China to the African Union was able to bring in business people both from China and from within Africa who have uh, been investing. The Chinese people have been investing in China to indicate their readiness to continue investing across Africa. So it's very, very, very good. What kind of partner do you see China in this process of Africa's building of its uh, free trade area? Well, a lot of uh, uh, companies uh, from China, we encourage them to establish in uh, Africa and uh, use the natural resource endowments of Africa uh, to produce at source can be in the green industrialization area, which is emerging and very, very, very important. It can be a production of food. It can be development of infrastructure and other connecting services. So that is most welcome. So there's a huge potential for increased investment from China in the various activities which are going to drive Africa's social economic development. I know that you're representing many sectors, uh, the business sector, the commercial sector, also tourism and yes. minerals. Yes. Um, when it comes to tourism and travel, uh, what do you hope to see happening um, going forward between China and Africa? Well, uh, quite a number of um, Chinese tourists would like to have the experience of visiting Africa. And they, they are most welcome. They will not be disappointed. We have a very huge variety of um, attractions there. Those who want to see uh, the pyramids of Egypt, they are free to do the, that. Then the, there are offerings of uh, world safaris across Africa. Quite a lot of uh, African countries have um, uh, huge attractions of wild animals, lions, elephants, and others. Then the, the Victoria Falls, one of the seven wonders of uh, the world. Um, and uh, for those who are ad adventurous, they can do some uh, bungee jumping 400 meters down uh, the Victoria Falls. So we have a lot to offer. What kind of globalization does Africa need going forward? Africa is committed to the multilateral system. Mm, a majority of our investors are members of the World Trade Organization. Then over and above that, we have what we call the African Continental Free Trade Area, which is going to really it is the foundation for building one African market. And the anchor to the African continent of free trade area is to start by liberalizing 90% of goods and services across Africa so that within 10 to 15 years, they are duty free. So that's how committed we are to openness. And to facilitate that, some of the measures which have been attacking is to come up with a payments and the settlement system where the daily settlements are going to be in local currencies with net settlement in the foreign exchange. So we are going to reduce the usage of foreign exchange in intra-African trade. Then we also have a protocol on free movement of people, right of residence, uh, right of establishment, which is going to facilitate visa-free travel of Africans across the continent. And those wanted to stay in different African countries other than their own, they should be able to do that. Already Kenya has announced that, Rwanda has announced that they are going to facilitate visa-free. Then in order to harmonize policies and regulations, also have a, poli a policy and, and a protocol on investment, a protocol on competition policy, and a protocol on uh, intellectual property rights. And then we are also facilitating the development of regional and continental value chains. Uh, because uh, with that, then we are going to ensure that there is a value addition within Africa and we are going to use industrialization.
as a basis for the development of intra-Afghan trade. Already, manufacturing is a major component of intra-Afghan trade. 42% of intra-Afghan trade is composed of manufacturers. The global average is 52%. We wanted to reach that global average. Finally, um, on the international relations, we've seen the expansion of BRICS taking place in Africa. Uh, we've seen uh, the consolidation of a Shanghai Cooperation Organization, APAC, coming forward. These organizations representing the global south, uh, including the African continent, and increasing member of uh, the countries there from Africa represented. Uh, how do you look at the future of the global south uh, in counterbalancing the existing world order? Well, the global south is emerging as uh, an economic force, and that is to be expected. Because uh, when we look at the world as it is now, most of the members of the Global South were in the uh, under-colonial room. Mm. And uh, in addition to that, there was huge demand for social economic development. And the investments have been uh, put in those areas to promote, in these regions, to promote uh, social economic advancements. And when you have reached a certain level of economic development, that also goes with the uh, responsibilities uh, in, the, in the global arena. And uh, that's why you find that uh, quite a number of um, countries here of the global south are in the G20. And for that very reason, uh, not too, too long ago, the African Union was uh, admitted as a permanent of the G20, which means that uh, 100% of the African countries are in the G20. And when you look at the population of the countries of the G20, mm -hmm, the issue of inclusivity comes in, because a majority of the population of the world comes from the global south. Yeah, Africa yes. is also the youngest continent. In and, the world. Uh, yes, so in, in terms of inclusivity, uh, certainly we see a great role for the global south in the emerging world order. Commissioner Mushanga, thank you so much for thank your you time. And that's it for this edition of The Hub. Thank you so much for tuning in. Our news coverage continues on CGTN. Bye and take care.